There we go. Um, all right, welcome back. And as usual, I'm interested in what you remember from the last lecture. So either in the chat or raise your hand. Um, what are things that you recall? What did we talk about? Um, what stuck with you? Testing for machine learning is different than traditional source code, right? Uh, we talked about model quality, that was a theme. Um, we talked about that you're averaging over multiple results, you don't expect perfect um, accuracy, right? Um, you're okay with some wrong results, you're averaging. And we talked a lot about kind of traditional model quality metrics, recall precision, area under the curve, right? Um, that you should always compare against some baseline. And then we talked more about a little bit the relationship to software testing, right? And whether there is such a thing as bugs and models or bugs and training data. I had a rant about uh, requirements engineering, but this is roughly where we ended. Right. So I still have the problem that I seem to run over every time in every lecture. I'm trying to catch up today. So there's still some content I wanna get to from, from the last lecture. Um, so let me start there. Um, oops, uh, this one. So when we left off, we kind of talked, we talked mostly about um, kind of tr the, the data science side, and then we talked about how software testing might be similar or not similar, right? So performance testing is maybe the closer analysis than traditional software testing. Um, but there are also things where kind of software engineering background might help. And I wanna talk a little bit more about this. And one thing where this might be the case is when you select your validation data, when you think about how are you going to test something, how are you going to um, uh, curate data sets? Um, the first question is what kind of validation data to collect and how much? So here I just copied some heuristics from the textbook that you had, right? So you kind of get a sense of how many, you kind of want a couple of hundred to a couple of thousand data points for most evaluations to get a sense. Um, you can also technically do power statistics, but I don't think that's too common that people do this. Um, but I think often more important than the quantity of the data is also how representative it is, right? So what's the quality of your test data? First of all, you want it to be representative of the population of the real data and representative of the training data, which you typically do by just randomly splitting the, all the data that you have into training and test set, right? Modulo kind of um, uh, dependencies in the data, but you kind of hope that this helps you to have the same distributions. Um, if that distribution is not corresponding to the distribution in practice later in production, you have a problem anyway, because you're learning uh, models on kind of biased data and you're evaluating it on biased data. Um, so you probably not only want to make sure that your training or validation data, that your validation data is representative, but also that your training data is representative, right? Um, but typically when we ask how much data do we need, um, this seems a little bit like how many tests should we write for traditional software, right? And if we think about kind of traditional software, I mean, there's a common question of where you ask, um, when can I stop testing, right? So people are notoriously bad at writing tests and then they wanna stop at some point, right? And you kind of ask how many tests should I write? Um, the honest answer in practice is, when time and money runs out, you stop testing, right? Um, but if you look into this, um, we have developed lots of techniques to kind of estimate test adequacy or test suite quality. And the typical approach is looking at coverage, right? So line coverage or branch coverage. Um, I assume you're all familiar where you kind of see what branches or lines in the code have been executed by a test suite. And then if you reach like 100% coverage, you're pretty confident um, that you have tested the software pretty well. Right? It doesn't give you any guarantees, but it's probably higher coverage is better than lower coverage. Um, 
There's also mutation testing, uh, which some of you might know, where you just inject faults into the system and you see how many faults can your test suite find. A better test suite would find more injected faults than a worse test suite, right? So you kind of can write tests until you're kind of confident that you have a certain mutation, cover, uh, mutation score that most of the injected faults, like random, randomly changing plus to minus and these kind of things, that those would be found. There's a question though, whether there's anything similar that you can do for machine learning. Like how much data should you look at? How big should your data set be? When have you tested your model well enough? And that seems kind of hard, um, right? So I didn't talk about specification coverage, but we don't have any specifications, right? So it's kind of hard to do kind of classic boundary value analysis or something where you can look at the specification says if the value is smaller than 20, so we try 20, 21, and 19 or something like this, right? So you can't really do much of this. Um, again, you care about representative data more than kind of um, corner cases in the specification, although maybe there is something that we can do about corner cases. For coverage, kind of branch coverage, what would be the equivalent? We can see whether we have, in a decision tree, we have seen all possible outcomes or all possible decisions, but we kind of expect that this will happen most of the time if our training and evaluation data is kind of representative. And even if it's not, if there are some branches in the tree that we've learned that we are not really testing, is this telling us much? I, I, I'm not so sure. For deep neural networks, there's actually a bunch of research papers that have looked into things like neuron coverage. So you have a bunch of images that you throw against your image classifier and it looks at which neuron can activate at least once or deactivate it at least once. But again, does neuron coverage correlate with anything here? And then finally mutation scores. Um, what should we mutate here? What kind of faults should we inject? Should we change the thresholds of one of the billion parameters in a deep neural network or a single decision in a decision tree? Um, so I'm not convinced that any of this is particularly useful uh, right now. So there are a couple of analogies that you can try and researchers have looked into this. Um, but my sense is that there's nothing kind of usable at this point. Um, to, to evaluate test quality. Um, the thing again that I'm coming back to is you wanna check whether your data is representative in some way. There are a couple of statistical techniques where you can kind of just compare distributions. So is, is the distribution of features in my validation set similar to the distribution of features that I see in production? And so those kind of questions you can ask. You can also ask questions of whether some data that you're testing on is somewhat similar to the training data, right? So some models can tell you that they're currently making predictions that are very far off things that they have ever seen in training. It's often called out of distribution predictions, right? So you have trained on some distribution on some data and you're asked to make a prediction on completely different data. Um, there are some approaches, some models that can essentially predict whether they have seen somewhat similar data in training, right? And then tell you that they're really not confident on making production uh, predictions here. Um, again, this is, this is, I think, more useful than any form of coverage, um, kind of looking at, for data drift, looking for distributions. Um, beyond that, let's skip these two parts, oops. Beyond that, I think there are a couple of things that you can still do by thinking about that not all inputs are equal. So the example here um, is something that Chris Ray from Stanford mentioned, that if you're Apple or Google and you're developing a voice recognition system like this, the one sentence that you don't wanna break ever is call mom, right? This is something that you people use a lot. And even if you're, even if you're making some changes in your system, uh, that's something that's really important that you don't wanna break. Um, similarly on Google Assist, something like, what's the weather tomorrow is one of the most frequent sentences that people are using this. 
And that's again, the thing that you don't want to break. Whereas adding some obscure ingredients to your shopping list may be less important, right? So what you can think about here is averaging over all um, possible inputs or all representative inputs gives you some average accuracy, but it doesn't necessarily re reflect that some of those inputs are more important or less. I mean, it reflects if, if it's representative, call mom will be much more common in your test set, right? And better accuracy on that will reflect better accuracy in general. But what you wouldn't de detect is if there are some less common but still important phrases in there, they might just, they might not be very common in your validation set, but they might still be very important. It's something where this comes up a lot is if you start thinking about fairness, um, so for example, speech recognition systems are often criticized for being performing much worse for people of color than people with certain accents, probably because they have seen less training data um, with those kind of accents and intonations. Um, and if in your validation set, you have very few of those examples, you might perform poorly on those, but it doesn't affect your overall accuracy too much, right? If you're just looking at overall accuracy, you're looking at all inputs as equal. Some are more frequent in your validation set, um, but you're not looking at um, differences really. Um, let me skip this and come to this later. So this is dangerous if the model makes some rare but biased mistakes that you really wanna detect, right? So in those kind of cases, um, what you want to avoid is um, you want to actually look for certain cases. And what uh, one strategy that you can do here is instead of just having one validation set, create multiple validation sets, right? Create different validation sets for different subpopulations. So for example, you could create a validation set just for the call mom uh, use case, right? Where you have just a thousand people saying call mom as a voice snippet and you test your accuracy on that. And you want this to be very, very high, right? Higher than the average. You can also think about having a data set specifically for speakers from certain minorities and want the accuracy in that validation set to be similar to your overall accuracy. A third thing that you can do is stretch goals. So you can think about very hard cases and you're kind of okay that right now they're not performing particularly well, right? So speech recognition on very poor audio recordings, for example, right? Lots of background noise. You know this is really hard and you're not really worried about if the accuracy right now is very low, but you wanna track this anyway to see whether over time you're doing better in those cases, right? So in all those cases, you kind of want to think about not just one validation set, but multiple validation sets and different validation sets for different groups. Actually, what you're building here is closer to a single unit test before, right? So if you have a, if you have a group of examples for call mom or for a specific dialect, right? So the, the example in the textbook is always coming kind of Hawaiian, uh, some Hawaiian pidgin English dialect, right? that's closer to a test suite, right? So a test case, a single test case. So you have many examples for a specific use case and you want the accuracy to be very high. It's not a single audio file, right? Or a single data point. It's still a data set of, you're averaging over multiple results. You're still accepting some wrong results, but you might have different expectations for accuracy on different subsets. The question now is how do you arrive at those subsets, right? How do you know what your kind of test cases, validation sets should be? And I think now you can go back to kind of black box testing and think about, well, you don't have a real specification, but you can think about what do we know about the problem? What do we know about the different users here? Um, can we look at some sort of requirements. Can we ask some experts about what they think important test cases are, right? Um, can we talk to diversity experts, for example, right? What to be aware of? Um, 
We can also look at user feedback or we can just look at how is our system performing in practice or even on the validation set, see are there certain parts of the input, certain characteristics of the input that our model performs particularly poorly on. So maybe that's something that where we can identify some characteristics, um, identify some potential problems um, and so on. So I want you to think about this for a second. So think about the cancer detection example, right? So you have an image of, of a scan, fMRI scan or something like this, and you want to detect cancer. So now you can just take a bunch of images um, from different um, patients, but are there certain groups that maybe should have their own validation set? Um, so give it a second, think about this, write this in the chat, but don't submit yet. I want to do the same thing where I'm just asking a bunch of you, all of you to write, click yes when you have written an answer or two, uh, but just click the yes button and don't submit it yet. Two yeses, three, four, five, eight, nine, one more, one more. All right, press enter. Okay, terminal stages of cancer. They are maybe particularly easy to detect, so you definitely want to detect those. Um, Older people, people with pre-existing conditions that you might perform. Otherwise, they may be less common, but are important, right? Um, certain locations of can cancerous cells, maybe some are easier or harder to find. Gender, yep. Um, age groups, um, benign and non-benign, depending on what you're, what you're uh, looking for, right? Um, um, right, so, so those are typical kinds of images. Um, different qualities of images was the last thing um, Daniel just wrote that I was thinking of. Um, that also maybe you specifically try low quality images and see how you're doing on those um, or transformed images uh, in some way. Right. So, and again, I think you can think of different examples here, right? So think of this as regression tests of kind of important test cases, the obvious cancer you definitely want to detect, right? Um, uniform fairness testing, you have a bunch of examples, age groups, gender, and so on. Um, and then stretch goals, maybe very hard um, to find ones, right? Um, things that uh, maybe also physicians have a hard time to find or uh, bad image quality, um, things like this. And again, you can think about, do kind of black box techniques help as some inspiration here? Um, Vivek, you have a question? Yeah, so what happens if the test cases, these obvious ones, they actually fail, but the model is overall good? Like, it's better than the previous model. So do we go ahead and, like, go ahead and deploy it or, We'll try to modify it so that it uh, covers those basic cases as well. Think of this as similar as you have a software system and you the test for one use case fail. Are you going mm -hmm. to go ahead and deploy or not? Maybe, right? It depends a lot on how important that specific use case is, how you, um, how you value that specific group. So for experience, for very important use cases, I suspect you don't really want to compromise, right? So if um, if call mom on Siri doesn't work anymore, I think you have a problem. You don't want to put this into production, even though the model works much better on your shopping lists and everything else. Okay, makes sense. Daniel? I, I was wondering if um, there's like automation around this, because it, it seems like, I don't know, I, I might be totally off on this, but like some sort of reinforcement learning where you train a model and then the reinforcement sort of engine assesses it against these criteria. So you get, you know, 
positive marks for assessing, you know, what we were calling unit tests well, and then, you know, it, it might do a subpopulation bad, so it got negative marks. And then the, you know, reinforcement learning would go back and change things. It would require, you know, defining that as a user, like what are the subpopulations, but I was wondering if any worked on that. I don't know anything in this area, but I wouldn't be surprised if things exist. Uh, the things that I can think of more directly is that you try to, you build another model that tries to predict the accuracy of a prediction. I'm pretty uh -huh. sure that, that that exists, right? So that you say, what's the accuracy of a prediction in terms of um, gender or in terms of, um, age and so on. And if you, if you let machine learning do this, you can also look for interactions, right? So is there a specific group of maybe old black people with certain pre-existing conditions where the system performs really poorly? Mm -hmm. I haven't actually read anything in this direction, but I would be surprised if that doesn't exist. Okay. And if not, you could build it probably fairly easily. Jake? Just a quick follow-up to the next question. Um, I would think if your model is performing well on the edge cases, but not the, um, you know, the, the, the trivial cases, there probably is another model out there that performs well in the trivial cases, and it would be worth considering some kind of ensemble system yep. that could incorporate both of them together. That might yep. be a good compromise. Yep. Right. Um, so just briefly, um, there are a couple of black box testing techniques that you might be familiar with, uh, depending on whether you've taken my analysis course before or not, or read anything about this. Um, boundary value analysis and partition testing and equivalence classes are things where you look at the specification, you look at the different kinds of inputs that you're expecting, and you group them, right? So you identify, for example, for gender, there are certain equivalence classes, right? And you have examples for both. Um, combinatorial testing and decision tables are techniques where you look at combinations of multiple of these classes. For example, you try to combine, you make sure that you see one combination of each gender with each age group at least once, things like this, right? Um, I'm not sure that you really want to push this th this far and really have um, 500 subpopulations, right? So at some point this becomes also hard to interpret and maybe you have too much noise. Um, but I think there is value in thinking about this and thinking of subpopulation as a single test rather than every single data row as a single test. Make sense? All right. I have one more larger topic and I'll try to speed up a little bit. Um, in traditional software testing, there is a lot of research and some practice on automated testing often called fast testing or random testing, where you take a program and you just feed it random inputs. Right? So the issue here is that you don't need to solve the Oracle problem. So you're, you're, creating, an, um, let me see. Um, you're creating a prediction, well, no, you're creating a test where you have some input, right? And this input you can just randomly generate. You can generate just millions of inputs randomly smart or not, there are a couple of different strategies here. And then you check whether the program behaves according to something. You still have the Oracle problem, right? So this is a problem with test case generation that it's easy to create millions of inputs, but how do you know whether the program actually does the right thing? Um, so traditionally there's a lot of fuzzing and fuzzing often looks for crashing bugs or certain security vulnerabilities, right? So the old strategy where this became really popular was when people re realized if they really just take random sequences of bytes and they feed them into Unix utilities in the late 90s, they would crash a bunch of them. They would trigger some kind of memory bugs, some kind of weird behavior. Um, this doesn't work that much anymore. We've fixed most of those bugs. Um, and fuzzers have become smarter. So fuzzers use things like symbolic execution or coverage guided fuzzing, where they try to identify inputs that execute more of the, of the implementation. But in the end, they still look mostly for crashing bugs or for things where they have some extra analysis to see here they access memory that they shouldn't access or things like this. 
Um, so when we look at machine learning, again, it's really easy to generate lots of input data, right? So if we have the housing price prediction model. I mean, I can generate you millions of houses with different numbers of rooms and different crime rates in the neighborhood and so on, right? I don't care, this is, this is easy, right? And I can do, I can be stupid and just uniformly sample, right? So be, every house has between one and 10 rooms or something like this. Or I can be a bit smarter and look about the distribution. So typically houses have two to three or four rooms maybe. So to uh, sample a bit more appropriately, or maybe I can be even smarter and look at relationships between this, right? So if I have square footage and rooms, they are probably somewhat correlated. So I'm producing um, samples that are more realistic. Right, um, requires a little bit more effort in modeling kind of distributions, but all of this is possible. But the problem is the, I can generate you tons of input data, but I don't know what the expected outcome is, right? Generating input data is cheap, but is this useful if I don't have any labels? So let's look back at how can we solve the Oracle problem? Um, the Oracle problem, I mean, manual generation or manual creation of that's the expected output doesn't really scale, right? So I could generate you random images and give, then give them to a human or a crowdsource worker and say, how many of those random images with let, just random pixels have cats in them or something, cancer, but that's expensive and I can't scale this and I won't do this for millions of images. In Traditional fuzzing, one strategy that works well is if you have a reference implementation, right? A gold standard. Um, this has been done in compiler fuzzing where you just have five different implementations of a C compiler. You randomly generate C programs. They're nonsensical most of the time, but they compile. And then you just compare whether they, the, the compiled version gen, uh, execute the same way, right? And people have done this and found a lot of uh, bugs and C compilers. If you have more than two implementations, you can even vote, right? Um, often this is used if you're very sure that one is correct and but maybe slow and you're developing a faster version that you want to behave the same way. For machine learning, it's again unclear where we would get this kind of executable specification or ground truth from, right? If we had one, something like this that could always predict this, uh, we wouldn't use the machine learning model in the first place, probably we would use that other thing. And then we come to the last two categories, which are, I think, interesting more here. Um, we have global properties, typically crashes, buffer overflows, code injection things. Is there something similar for machine learning models. Can we think of any examples where a machine learning model should behave in a similar way for all possible inputs that we could ever feed into this? Or partial specifications. So in code, this would be typically assertions that check like whenever the input to the square root function is negative, we show have, should have an exception, right? So we don't check what happens in the positive case, but we have a specification for the negative case. So the question is, can you think of any sort of invariance or global specifications or anything that you can think of that should work for some machine learning models? Right, so is there something that you can think of all cancer prediction or all housing price predictions? Whatever we feed into the model, we want to learn something about the output. Any ideas? So some learning forms can be used to set boundaries on the size of the feature space and the output space. Um, so you could check whether no possible input would ever violate this. Is this what you're thinking about? Yeah, you might be able to, you know, if you know that your model is making simplifications about your input features, then you could reduce the, pos the total set of input features you need to test against. Oh, I see. So, so if you know that your model isn't using a specific feature, you could actually check that 
if you just swap the feature or change that, the output should be the, the, the same. Yes. This, um, this is sometimes used in fairness research. For example, you do um, loan predictions and you just randomly generate kind of input data, kind of people with what, whatever their, I don't know, um, income history and loan history and so on. So you just ra ge randomly generate people and then you swap the gender. As a single attribute, you just swap the gender. And if you expect that gender should not be used in training, then you expect that the result is the same. Right, so you could randomly generate input data and make sure that for every pair of male, female combinations, you expect the same result. In practice, this doesn't work well because you have correlated attributes and randomly generating data and just switching the gender doesn't produce relevant results. We get back to this in, in fairness lecture later. This is much harder. Um, but as a basic thing, some of these fairness properties can be invariants uh, that you can express. Here are a couple more examples. Um, so the first one is the one that I just talked about. You have a prediction and for all input data, if I replace gender by male, the prediction should be the same as if I replace gender by female, right? So this is what, what we just talked about. So I'm comparing two predictions on arbitrary test data, right? And the X's I can generate, I can take from whatever source I do, um, could be smart or less smart data. There is some work, and that's actually one of the readings that you looked at, um, where they look at kind of synonyms or likely faults in, um, in kind of natural language modeling, right? So one example in there is if you do sentiment detection, so you wanna see whether there's a positive or negative sentiment in a text, it shouldn't matter whether you write is not or isn't Right, so what, for every sentence that has a positive sentiment but contains is not, if we replace this by isn't, we want the same positive sentiment. I don't know how easy or hard this paper was to read. Um, the reason why I wanted to give this to you and kind of just point you at it is what they were really doing was looking for invariants. They were looking for synonyms that if you replace them, they should still hold, right? So they weren't actually checking whether the sentiment is correct or not. They were checking whether the, uh, the classifier is robust against kind of these synonyms, right? Against certain changes that we think should be invariant, right? This shouldn't influence the classifier. There's a couple of similar things that you can do. If you have a sentence in the form X is Y, you should be able to swap is to is not and get the negative result, the opposite result, right? Depending on what you're trying to understand. You can probably find counterexamples and you're probably again, okay with some, like, like in the paper that you read, the ACL paper, um, they had, they were fine with like 99 or 98% accuracy of these invariants, right? They didn't need to hold perfectly. Um, but that's also one possibility. Another thing that people do more frequently and we will also talk much more about later is looking at robustness. So one invariant that you can test a model with is that around training data, perturbations should still produce the same result, right? So this is often done with uh, image recognition like you're trying to detect stop signs or something like this. If you're detecting whether there's a stop sign in an image or not, whether you slightly rotate the image or add a little bit of noise or kind of change only five pixels, any of those changes should not change the outcome, right? So that's often a robustness specification. So you're saying all possible values around those training data sets uh, should produce the same outcome. So what we're doing here is for, um, for all training data and for all mutations around the training data, we want the result to be stable, right? It's the same outcome. And then you can also have hard coded rules that you want the model to enforce. 
um, it's probably easier to do this outside of the model, but you could check a model for something like this. So sufficient conditions and explainability. Again, something we'll talk about later this is called anchors. So these are sufficient condition to come to a prediction. So you're saying if the credit score is below a certain value, the loan should always be rejected, right? So that's something that you can test. So these are invariants for the model. Typically, you can also test this at the, at the system level. Um, it's kind of hard to come up with invariants. Uh, it's domain specific. You sometimes need, need experts. You can do some invariant mining. So this is called specification mining in software engineering. It's called anchors in uh, explainable um, machine learning. So there are a couple of techniques where you can try to think about how to find them, but often you kind of have experts thinking about this. And just so that you've heard the term in the software engineering literature, uh, in the research community, this is called metamorphic testing. Um, metamorphic testing is about what's called metamorphic relations um, that relate to inputs and to outputs in a specific way. So it always has a form where you say for all possible inputs, you want the, a transformed version of the input to be equivalent to the prediction of the model and then apply some transformation. Right, so one way that we could have just done this is um, one side is a replace is by is not and the other point side is negating the result. Right, so with these two functions plugged in into this metamorphic relation, um, we express the invariant that we just had. Um, so, I, so people have looked at this a little bit, at different metamorphic relations, um, at different ways of expressing this, but in general, you can just think of this as any form of invariance that go across different kind of properties, different relations of inputs. All right, Vivek? Yeah, so going back on the previous slide, I was a little confused about the male and female uh, example that was given up, given up about. What we are trying to say is we do not want any uh, dependency on the gender, uh, mm -hmm. but we will be giving this data to the model. So yep. is, isn't that like the model is always going to learn from the data. So isn't it better that to not give this as a feature altogether to the model? There's a, let's, let's take this offline by a couple of weeks. This has a really long and complicated answer. Um, just by taking the data out um, doesn't mean the model doesn't pick up on gender through some proxies. Um, taking the data out itself, um, or, so often you want to enforce some sort of invariance in the learning process or you test afterward. Uh, this is actually, really complicated. There are many different approaches toward fairness and different definitions. This is a really trivial definition um, that's not very useful in practice. So it's probably not a great example for an invariant that you really care about, but it's a simple one to start with. Um, any other questions on metamorphic relations and kind of testing invariants? So I think that's a potentially powerful technique where you can, if you can specify invariants, you can automatically generate test cases. People have used this for a couple of examples. Um, they've used this for self-driving cars in combination with uh, simulators. Um, but again, it's, it's not trivial. Um, it, by the way, also fits this model that um, Machine learning models are more like requirements because what we're checking is the compatibility of multiple requirements, right? So we have a requirement that stays there's some fairness invariant and we want to check that they're compatible. Um, and again, once we have these invariants, once we have these metamorphic relations, generating test data, that's the easy part, right? Uh, even generating somewhat realistic test data, it's not quite as easy, but that's quite easy to just generate millions of inputs. Uh, what we are just assuming is we don't know what the output is unless we invest heavily in labeling, um, but we can still check certain invariants, certain properties. All right, 
Um, just very briefly, um, continuous integration is something that we talk about lots in software engineering, right? So automatically running test cases whenever you make a change. Obviously you can do exactly the same thing also for machine learning. Um, it will typically not fail or pass the test suite unless you define specific thresholds, but it's still easily possible to just repeatedly execute your learning pipeline and your evaluation pipeline and come up with a number and see that over time you're reporting uh, better results. Right? So there are a couple of dashboards and results out there, a bunch of tools that prioritize for this that give you pretty numbers. TensorFlow, uh, TensorBoard is maybe one of the more common ones. There are also more academic systems that track this and you can specify thresholds and they will alert you or uh, give you a badge whether CI has failed. Um, MLflow, this is something where you see different models, you see how long it took to train them in different versions, what data you use, um, what the parameters were, or this is different parameters on the same model, so this is for hyperparameter optimization, and it compares different metrics. Right, so I think if you're, if you're familiar with continuous integration, none of this is surprising. I think it's not surprising that you can adjust something like this. Um, so I'm not going to spend more time on this, but I think it's very useful to think about setting up something like this whenever you change your model, when you train something, retrain something and, and track data. All right. So this is what, all that I want to talk about last time, um, which was thinking about kind of model quality, right? How can we assess just the quality of the model, not the entire system, not the pipeline? There's a lot of traditional accuracy metrics. Um, software testing is not the best analogy. It's maybe better if you think of validation sets, multiple of them as tests. Um, but still, we can. there's something that we can learn, I think, from software testing about carefully selecting test data, not all inputs are equal, and thinking about invariance and continuous integration. Any questions? And honestly, most of this is not that important because in practice, what people are doing is they test in production. We we'll talk about this more, right? We had this discussion last time after class about if you split into tests and validation set, and then you look at the test data, do you need to collect new one? Uh, Theoretically, yes, in practice you test in production and that's always unseen data, um, but we get to that and that has its own problems. All right, so I'm trying to cut this part a little bit shorter. Um, I think I already tried to motivate this over and over again, that we, we try to move beyond the model. The last lecture was the last one where I really just wanted to focus on the model, kind of evaluating the model quality, right? We, we need to think about this as larger systems that have machine learning and non-machine learning components. Um, so the model is often just one part of the system, right? So we talked about this with the transcription service and in these slides, I have a ton of examples. I just wanna go through some of them a little bit more closely. Um, so Microsoft PowerPoint has this feature of design ideas in the latest version. Has anybody used this? It's actually pretty cool. So you can create a slide, like a boring looking slide like this. You click a button and it gives you a ton of suggestions about how you could lay out this slide. And the suggestions typically fit what kind of design you have, right? So if you have a slide like me here with a ton of text, then it produces designs that are suitable for a ton of text. If you have bullet points, it will produce often slides with flow charts and things like this. So that's something that you could do with machine learning, right? Um, you just look at a lot of examples of well-designed slides and then different forms of them and learn, um, maybe have some people rate things, uh, what looks good or, or things like this. Um, but again, if you think of PowerPoint, that's a one component, right? That's actually this one button here in all this functionality that's in there. They have machine learning in a bunch of different parts, but it's one feature. And people probably won't buy PowerPoint just because it's one feature, right? And if that's one feature performs poorly, they probably don't ditch PowerPoint and start using OpenOffice, open which doesn't have this feature at all, right? Or Google Slides. 
Um, so again, it's a component as a part of a larger system. It, Temi, it was a really important component. Here, it's a much smaller component, right? Probably not mission critical. Also, if you think about smart devices, there's a lot of push in medical devices to become smarter. One common example is fall detection. It's for elderly people where you try to detect whether they fall down. There are a couple of different ways of doing this uh, with smart watches. They often have a feature like this, but there's also hearing aids that get some sort of sensors that can be detect this, and also wall and floor sensors. And again, you have some machine learning here that um, thinks about what counts as a fall, right? So you train this, you see certain activations, um, but in the end, you still want to think about how do I integrate this with a larger system, right? How does this integrate with somebody automatically calling uh, emergency services, for example? When should you do this? How should you do this, right? Um, and there are many more examples. You looked at the fraud detection case study um, as a homework assignment, right? Again, larger system. The model was very central here, but again, lots of concerns around it that you wrote about in your answers. With recidivism prediction, um, the model is simple and probably the software is relatively simple, but it's integrated into a human process where judges interact with the system, the society has requirements, right? So there are lots of things that push on this model um, and lots more examples that I wanna go into. So it's really important to think about systems. Systems thinking is a discipline in itself where you think about that everything is interconnected, right? So you think about different components, how the system might influence the environment, the world, how this kind of comes back. You want to understand the dynamics, the feedback loops, that actions have effects and how humans interact with the system. Um, there is no good term as far as I know about describing machine uh, systems with a machine learning component. In this course, I'm calling this AI enabled systems. I've read ML enabled systems. Microsoft Research has this called this ML infused systems. Um, there is not much around this. There, there are terms like ML systems engineering that often has a different connotation, AI operation, data ops, ML ops. So just accept this will probably be clunky and hopefully in a couple of years we have a more standardized term. To think about this, I think um, the distinction in the textbook is a good starting point. I made you read this, right? So, um, Hulton distinguishes between to build an intelligent system, right? So a system with intelligence in it with a machine learning component or AI component, you need first of all to think about what's a meaningful objective. Then what's the experience, the design of the experience. So this is about user interaction. How do you pre present the predictions to a user? Do you take actions? How do you elicit feedback and telemetry? Then how you actually implement the system, which is not just the model, right? It's really the deployment part and collecting feedback and the infrastructure. You have the actual model learning part, which is smaller. And then he calls this orchestration. I would call this operations, maintaining and updating this and monitoring this over time. So let's think through these examples. What, what might this mean? So if we are building Microsoft Office or we're extending it, and we're putting in a machine learning component, what's our objective? It's kind of an intelligent system with a smaller component, but what would you consider as an objective here? Certainly not have the most accuracy in predicting the slide that the user actually wants, right? That's a very low level model specific objective. Help users create documents more easily, right? So that's a user specific view. We look at this distinction next uh, on Thursday, um, assist users to create better looking slides. What's the business goal of Microsoft behind this, 
So get users to click on suggestions. That's something that they want, but why do they want this, right? Make the product more competitive, essentially sell more copies or keep the users, right? keep them paying for licenses. It's typically for companies it all ends up with money at the end, right? So you have some goal of tr how you try to make money. You're not going to sell this just because of this feature, but overall you keep the product um, useful against competitors. Um, people keep this, keep paying for this. So for the user interface design, there are a couple of decisions in here, right? Um, so they needed to think about, we have a model that can make predictions for a slide. How should we lay it out? They can actually give you multiple predictions. Um, there are lots of choices here. How do we do this, right? Should we show a pop-up? Hey, here's a better version of your slide. Should they just change your slides while you're typing this? Right? The, the way that they designed this here is you actually have to know about this feature. You have to go to this button, click it, then it shows you a bunch of predictions. You need to choose one and then you can create it. If the prediction is wrong, like creates poor results, I probably won't click on one of them. But even if I do, I can still undo it. Right? So there's not a huge risk in this user interface design it's also not very visible, right? So Microsoft isn't pushing this feature on me. There's certainly a lot of effort in figuring out how can we implement this at scale? So is this running in locally on my machine or is this sending the slides to the cloud? Then how do I build the infrastructure that I can look at tons of clouds? Um, how can they get telemetry? How can they figure out how many people are using it? How happy are people with this? What kind of usage information would you collect if you were Microsoft? What would you know about how people are using this, how happy they are, how good you're doing, how well you're doing? Yeah, so um, how often do they use this feature? How often do they actually click on one of the suggestions? You can think of how often are they undoing it afterwards, right? Um, how, how much time are they spending with this feature? Um, usage of the top recommendations, so a bunch of things, right? And again, you want to collect some data. You also need to be careful about privacy. So what kind of data can you actually see, right? Do you know about the things where the users are really unhappy with predictions? What kind of slides are those, right? Can we learn something about to improve the system? The intelligence creation, I suspect there's a data analyst that can think about this and figure out how to do these things. And then operations, we need to update this. We need to kind of figure out if users are unhappy with certain slides, can we improve this and so on. All right. Um, so I think the user interactions is actually an interesting part. I made you read a little bit on this. I, uh, for next week, I'm assigning two more chapters that talk about this a little bit more. Um, there's really a lot of design considerations. How do I present predictions to a user? Um, there's this forcefulness thing of do I take actions automatically? Do I make suggestions? Um, how do I influence that the user actually does what I wanted to do with the system, right? So a lot of systems want to influence behavior. I'm not sure that Microsoft has any specific goal here with this. How do I minimize consequences of flawed predictions? We talked about this um, in the Microsoft case. You can undo this, right? You don't even you see a preview of your changes um, and so on. Um, so let's talk about the other example here, fall detection. Right, so, how would you, so you're predicting whether somebody has fallen and needs medical attention, right? So that's a goal. The overall goal is save lives maybe, right? Uh, get help when somebody needs help. So, your device, let's say a smartwatch, can predict whether somebody has fallen and can predict whether maybe you should call the ambulance. How would you present the prediction to a user? Would you automatically take actions? Would you make suggestions? Any combinations? 
So maybe contact the family automatically. Um, ask the user is a different option, right? So um, vibrate maybe on your phone. I've detected a fall. Should I call the ambulance? Automatically call the ambu ambulance. Maybe you have a, some confidence or some rating of how confident you are. Prompt the user to call a screen, uh, 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 to tap the screen for help. Probably actually you might want to do the opposite. Say, I'm going to call the ambulance in 30 seconds unless you tap the screen to abort, right? Because the users might not be able to do this. Um, so those kind of design decisions here, maybe also leave it up to the user what they want. Um, there are lots of trade-offs here, right? And they go beyond the model. This is really the user interface design. Um, and you want to think about some of those decisions help more toward your goal of getting help if needed, and some of them are less efficient. Some of them have more consequences if you have fault, faulty predictions, right? So if you predict that somebody has fallen and they haven't already, and you immediately call the ambulance, this might be kind of pricey, um, also causing a lot of stress, right? So what's your way of undoing bad predictions do you give them a buffer place, right? Um, and also, how do you collect data to learn from mistakes, right? So is this thing internet connected? Can you recognize that you thought somebody has fallen, but they actually haven't? If they tap a button to abort, right? That's one way. Also, can you detect that somebody has actually fallen, but you didn't recognize it? That might be even harder, right? Where you um, didn't miss a mistake. So lots of challenges here. There are a couple of things um, to think about. One is the forcefulness of the interaction. So how hard it is to ignore or to stop. Are we just calling the ambulance immediately? Are we interrupting the user with vibration to ask them to call the ambulance? Maybe give them a time window. Maybe just pop up a nice pop up. Oh, I think you have fallen. Uh, if you want to call the ambulance, click this button. Right, or here's a phone number to call the ambulance. Um, so it can be very passive as well. Um, and it's kind of hard to choose what to do, right? Um, in addition, you can automate, you can, yeah, you can prompt, you can organize information, you can annotate. Um, you can also think about frequency. Um, the falling case is maybe less important, um, but there are lots of examples where you can think about how often should I inform somebody that something has changed and the prediction changes, right? So think about weather forecast. Should I tell you every time I think um, it will rain in the next five minutes or not, or I, I update my prediction, right? Um, should I tell you once a day, uh, once an hour? Should I just, like in Microsoft, they are not telling me once in a while that they have a nice suggestion for my slide, right? Because I guess this might feel annoying. Um, instead, they are waiting for me to go there. And there's this trade-off between notification fatigue, right? If Microsoft would just ping me all the time, they have a suggestion for making my slide prettier, I would probably get annoyed. But also, if they never show me any notification, am I going to learn about this feature? Am I missing an opportunity here, right? So again, interface design, how do I learn this feature? How do I, um, how much, how invasive do I want to be and so on. And to consider also the right forcefulness and frequency, you really want to think about what's the value of a correct prediction, what's the cost or damage of a wrong prediction, um, how good is my model, like how confident is it in making predictions. Right? So if we think about this again, um, with fault detection, you probably want to be quite forceful, but you also want to think about there's a cost of making false alarms. There's value of rescuing somebody if they're actually falling. And there are concerns here. You may make different decisions if you're in an early experimental stage where you might detect some faults, but also often are noisy versus in a more solid stage if you're pretty confident that if your model detects a fall, then it's most likely a fall. Right, so at different stages, different model quality, you might do quite different decisions here. All right, and the last big design problem that we will talk about much more is 
different forms of user interactions allow for different kinds of feedback and you really want feedback often, right? So you want to learn from feedback, you want to see how, how good your model does, but also improve your training. And certain user interactions allow for more feedback, right? So for example, if you, if you want to detect whether somebody has fallen, but you haven't detected it, right? So you could ask them once a day, did you fall yesterday? probably pretty annoying again, right? Kind of notification fatigue. Maybe you can ask on very low confident predictions. You think uh, there might be a fall, but I'm not sure. Maybe that's the case when you ask whether somebody has fallen, right? But you don't call an ambulance as you would do otherwise. So there's lots of questions here. How do you ask about feedback? How do you um, identify how good your model is? And there are lots of ideas and lots of creativity, and it depends a lot on the context of what you can learn from and so on. So I already talked about this, so I guess I don't need to ask you about this. You talked about telemetry ideas for the Microsoft thing. I talked about um, fall detection. Is there anything else, any other form of telemetry that you're thinking about in these cases that we haven't talked about? You might actually upload um, all the sensor data from the watch to the cloud to be able to retrain your model. Um, you get more data this way, but you also drain the battery and you um, have privacy concerns. Mean time to failure, depends on what failure means, but yes. Uh, um. All right, maybe just as an outlook. Um, I like the Timmy example because I think it's clever about telemetry. Um, there's the obvious point down here where they're just asking users about how well they're doing. But I think the much more interesting idea, and I hope they're doing it, is they're detecting when I'm changing my transcript, when I'm fixing words in the text editor. Right? So I'm having a cloud-based text editor here. It's actually really nice to work with because it synchronizes audio and text. So I can listen to this and it shows me where I am in the text. And I can also go jump somewhere in the text and it jumps to the right point in the audio. So they actually invested a lot of effort into this user interface design. And I think because of this, people are much more likely to modify and fix the transcriptions in this editor, right? Because it provides the right features. This is the right place to do this. And then when I change some words, that's a pretty clear sign that they got something wrong and it provides great training data for the future, right? Because they already have the audio, they know what's right. Modular privacy concern, concerns, so I'm not sure what they're doing there. All right, I have two more points. One is safety. Again, a system view helps a lot. Um, the example that the book gives is a smart toaster. I'm not entirely sure which chapter, whether I asked you to read this. Um, but consider a toaster that uses some cameras to figure out how long it should toast bread, right? Occasionally, it may make wrong predictions. And since this includes electricity and heat, I might be concerned about safety here, right? So. I'm okay if the toaster is smart and it sometimes makes a mistake and it burns my toast, but it shouldn't, certainly shouldn't burn down my kitchen. So the question here is, how can we make the system safe? Right, so I think it's very hard to ever think of a machine learned model as safe. Right, so we kind of always assume a model could make some mistakes, even with some recent effort on kind of robustness certification and so on. We kind of expect most of the time it will be fine, but it may make mistakes and those mistakes are not predictable. But even though we have an unreliable component in our system, how can we make sure that the toaster doesn't burn down my kitchen? So 
Right, so set certain limits, hard code time off, so it shouldn't toast for more than five minutes. Um, set a, if you have another sensor, monitor the maximum temperature and shut it off if it goes beyond this, right? Um, so uh, I have this, right? So assume you have a function continue toasting that you're learning based on some camera image um, in the beginning of how the toast looked before you toasted it, the camera image now and some temperature reading and some user preferences and just tells you, should I continue toasting or not? Right, and you already said you could just stop at some point. If I've been toasting for more than five minutes, stop. If I already have the temperature reading, if it goes beyond a certain threshold, stop. You can even think about simple hardware components. So a thermal um, fuse is a simple example. That's a hardware device that stops electricity if it becomes too hot. Right, so this is actually something that's in a bunch of motors and so on. So if they, if this kind of overheats, it just burns the fuse, some are also reusable, and it just stops electricity. Right? So that's a simple hardware device that you can put in your toaster just to make sure that you're not burning your kitchen. It's completely separate from the model. That's a pretty standard approach in safety engineering that you think about redundancies, about safeguards, right? And we have a long history of building safe systems from unreliable components. Um, so there are a couple of things that we can do, even if the model is unsafe, if we look at the larger system, we can still design something safely. Oops. Um, all right. Um, we could improve the model. We can think about the user interactions, that the user is in the loop, right? We can have better hardware. Um, but in all cases, it's not just model accuracy, right? So we're not fixing it by providing more training data. And then one more thing, um, infrastructure. This was part of the technical debt paper that you read, um, which actually is one of the early papers that everybody in this community refers to when you're thinking about kind of software engineering. Um, the technical that metaphor in this paper is a bit forced or they have a very simplistic view on what technical debt means uh, in my view, but I think they have the heart in the right place in that they are really thinking about the larger system and what it takes to build this. And so one thing that they're talking about is that in terms of code that you write to, to kind of deploy and maintain a model and that's not even thinking about the rest of the system. It's pretty much just a pipeline. Um, that's a massive amount of code, right? So you have some data collection code, some uh, feature extraction code, some serving infrastructure, some monitoring code. And the actual code that you use to learn the model is maybe two lines of scikit-learn code, right? Get the model, fit the model, or it's maybe 10, 20 lines of um, deep learning code. By the way, you're looking at deep learning code and recitation tomorrow. Um, so the entire pipeline is much bigger, right? There's much more implementation effort here. This paper now is five years old. In machine learning terms, five years is a very long time. Actually, a lot of these boxes probably have shrunken a lot, right? So the machine learning code is very small because we're just using a library. And now for a lot of things, we are also just using library or services like serving infrastructure. We can just rent certain services of AWS or Google where you just upload the model file and they take care of the serving, right? Um, monitoring, there are tons of open source infrastructure that we can set up to monitor a system that will help us with this task, right? Uh, machine resource management, things like Kubernetes, cloud management and so on. This has all shrunken in the last five years. There's lots of automation, lots of innovation um, and standardization, but there's still a lot more than just the model learning, right? Um, so, Again, it's, it's really important to think about pipelines. Get away from the model as a single artifact, but think of the pipelines that produce the model and put it into the system. Because we really want to think about how can I update the model? How does something change? Um, how do I detect how it's running in production? Um, 
there's another so Google has been running workshops with customers and trying to help them um, with machine learning. One of the observations that they're reporting from kind of dealing with hundreds of customers is really this mind switch, uh, this mental model, um, there's a paper down here, the key challenge claim, uh, the switch from um, thinking about a model to thinking about the pipeline is really hard. This is something that organizations struggle with, but this is really an essential change because otherwise you have this dirty pipeline, lots of scripts that build the model once and you can never update it. You can't debug it. You can't uh, change something, right? So you really want to think about kind of a DevOps continuous deployment pipeline. And that means you need to automate all of this. Um, so there's a lot of effort that typically goes into this. Any questions? All right. Um, and again, if you're thinking about the entire system, then again, it's not just accuracy. You have all kinds of qualities that you care about. Good enough might be good enough for a lot of machine learning models, right? So maybe for Office, it doesn't matter that they're always predicting the best layout slides, as long as users kind of like the feature and they can choose among a bunch of them, right? Uh, sometimes the machine learning component is a critical component. Sometimes it's just a gimmick. Sometimes you can improve predictions, but only at excessive costs and it might be much easier to deal with this in other ways and design a better user interface or um, change how the system works. Um, and so overall, I think, what I tried to do today, I actually managed to catch up here, is think about the entire system. Don't just think about the model, right? I hope that's obvious and I kind of try to pitch this from the start, but this is, I think, where software engineers come in, right? Where we have a lot of experience to tell, thinking about pipelines, thinking about quality assurance of the infrastructure, thinking about requirements engineering, how to, how to design user interfaces, um, how to integrate this into a larger system, how to deploy it and maintain it. So again, what I try to do here is kind of think about the system from a system perspective, right? Go beyond the model. Um, I think thinking about components like objectives, user interface, infrastructure, the AI component and operations is a good way of breaking things down. We talked a bit about the design space. There's lots of work out there. Um, and then really think about quality at the system level um, and the infrastructure uh, to produce those results. That's what I have for today. Are there any questions on any of this? Otherwise, let me stop here. Let me stop the recording and then I stick around as usual. <laughs>